Okay, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is day number seven. Seven days already. Wow. We've been going. Yes, we're kind of at a little <laughs> over midway through. And uh, yeah, it's been tremendous. Yesterday we, we seemed to really be focusing on the prophetic calendar, the prophetic foundations of our faith, and then last night, Pastor Adrian showed a divine pattern between tithing and then also the Sabbath and the feast and the attack, the calendar wars that are going on. And we see that they've been magnified in the channel, magnified through the feasts. And so at this time, we're going to open up with a few hymns, and Malcolm and David are going to come up and lead us out. Just watch when you guys come up, there's cords everywhere, so wash your feet. I tripped on one already. Wait, grasshopper. Jesus is all the world to me. I don't know what hymn number that is. And I don't have my phone, so we will wait for someone to announce it. 185. 185. Jesus is all the world to me.
So Max asked to just stay back and study and make a few phone calls this morning. Oh, yes. <coughs> cool. It is well with my soul. Is that 5.30? We don't have the hymn number. 5.30. 5.30. Hymn number 5.30. <coughs> from and, and in the verse in Colossians 2 14 it says blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that is that was against us contrary to us took it out of the way nailing it to his cross the handwriting of ordinances very yeah. mysterious like what is that mm, uh, record of yeah record sins. what is it record in um, when Adrian and I updated the book on Colossians we, we really looked at this verse deep and we took the Septuagint and actually, the, the dogma of, of condemnation, mm. it's the death decree that wow. we have against others who sin. Which is ultimately a, a against death decree us. Of mm. We just feel that we deserve death. So if people want to check that out, they should check that out. I think yeah. that's really, really interesting. We did a lot of work on this handwriting of ordinances. 
Because if you read it that way, it can sound like the Law of Moses. Ordinances. Uh, it doesn't say sin. It says handwriting ordinances. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, that's just another study. And um, I'll start with prayer. Yeah. Yep. Father in heaven, we just thank you. We could come and worship together. We ask that you be with us and you help us to understand your ways and your truths mm -hmm. because we have all this history of how we've misunderstood things. And though you forgive our ignorance, it, our ignorance has had consequences in history. It's led us down wrong paths um, rather than uh, leading to a true and perfect understanding of you, which is what we want, that we can go through the time of trouble mm. and be ready to see Jesus. So uh, as we go through some of this history, I pray it be a blessing to all those listening. Uh, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So if I missed the first few days of this because I was with my family. We had a chance to go to the Grand Canyon and uh, Antelope Canyon and Zion National Park. And I was in Zion National Park and we were in a hotel just outside the park, which is really beautiful, really, really nice, uh, aptly named. And on the last day, I was, I was, um, my dad told me that there was a, there was a meteor shower. I don't know if you, you knew this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, since in Bangkok we don't see any stars, I stayed out to, uh, I woke up at like five and I went out and I just lied down in the grass and looked at the stars. Uh, it's funny how he, um, when I have a joke where God says that, Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars. And us Bangkok people look up, one, two, <laughs> two, two children. <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, but when you're out there, it was sort of high up and so many stars, and, and I almost feel like if my eyes were a little bit better, I could see much more, just like kind of mm. out of out of your vision. And I saw like four or five shooting stars, that was really nice. Cool. And then my parent, my sister and my mom went for a hike, and they drove into the park, but I missed it, and I was sad because I was already awake, Now I, I want to hike, and, and uh, but we're still in this sort of valley with these beautiful mountains, but when there's no trail, you can't just hike. You can't just. I, I realized, I, I, and I was. So I walked down to this park that was nearby, and it was still. It was still totally dark, and I don't know. I'm just kind of sitting in the park, wondering what to do, and I cross this bridge, and there's a trail, just there. I said, "Where's this, where this trail go? Well, let's let's follow it. You just it's you just think it's the power of the trail. Without without a trail, you can't go. You can't go through the forest without a trail. You can try. You get lost. You get lost." Or in this case, it's not a forest because it's all a mountainy. But like, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna go up the mountain directly? You can't. You have to kind of go, you know, in a way that's less steep. And then you don't really know the way you're going. When there's a trail, you feel sort of safe. You feel, you feel you can, you can go. And you don't know who made the trail. You don't know even where the trail's going. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I had this beautiful hike, sort of just because in the park there's so many people. But here there was no one because we were, I was outside the park. And I was just thinking about the trail that God has left for us um, and how blessed we are to have that trail. And we might think that we could be our own independent man and just cut through the forest. That's really, really difficult. But there are parts in the trail that sort of split off and you don't really know which way to go. And there's parts of the trail that look much less traveled wonder, is that the way to go? Um, and so, uh, as I was just thinking about that, as I was thinking about Fred Wright and things that have happened in, in Adventist history, whether we can sort of see where we've come from, see sort like, I think God can help us to see where he's trying to lead us, the, the big picture of where the trail is supposed to go, because we kind of have the sense that we want to go to the top of the mountain, but... There's a few different peaks, or, or we're not exactly sure how to get there, or what, 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 what it takes to get there. But I think it's starting to become more clear, because this immovable platform, 
And there's certain steps. Uh, Adrian's mentioned at the, 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 the top of the, of the Pentagon. Pentagon, I guess I don't want to say the pyramid, or the <laughs> top of the, the system is the character of God, because that's internal life. But just how to get there, how to understand God. So I want to look at Fred Wright, because Fred Wright was a pioneer of the God does not kill message. And I want to look at his life and what things we can learn from it. And uh, in this sort of modern Adventist history since this famous book, Questions on Doctrine. And you guys might want to um, come closer. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's worth getting closer if you can't see it. because. So it starts off with this. This God is like hill. That means a few people associated it with it, but mostly we associate it with this book, Behold Your God, which is Fred Dryden's most famous book on, on God Not Destroy. And so I, I wonder, who is this man? How did he come to this doctrine? What's his background? What's interesting is I was looking up this thing. I don't know if you know this, man. I find on Ray Foucher's website that he has an uh, annotated version of Behold Your God Edited and expanded by Gary Holquist oh. in 2005. Oh, I didn't know that. So Gary was working on the, that Gar in 2005. Gary accepted the character of God in 1980. Yes, yeah. So it's been on Gary's mind. For um, a while. <laughs> so yeah, we know the famous equation here. Eternal life and so eternal life is connected to the character of God. Mm -hmm. Knowledge of God is eternal life. And I think this book was written late 70s? 79. 79, originally 79. And then I found out later that he originally started to preach it around 74. 1974. Just some background on him. Uh, I, I learned some of this from, uh, from Craig Jacobson, because he's Australian. And, but I found a book. Born right is Australian? Yes. He's, he's New Zealand. Oh, he's a New Zealander, but he... He moved to Australia. Lived most of his to life. To about, about an hour and a half from where we live now. Yes, yeah. So he was in Longburn College, and he was a woodwork teacher there, and then he moved to Australia. So I read, he has a book that he wrote before he died about his early life. And um, it's interesting is that his grandparents, before his mom was born, bought... Uh, Adventist books, Daniel, mm -hmm. Re Daniel Revelation, and never read them. Daniel Revelation and some other books. So he, they had it in his house. Hmm. They lived way out in the country, so I think they, they weren't Adventists. They didn't, I don't think they even went to church. Hmm. And actually, Craig Jacobson has, has mentioned this to me, that, that this is this sort of legendary story of, of, the, of Fred Wright's family, how they accepted the Sabbath totally alone. Uh, so mm -hmm. what, what ends up happening is, they brought great, they bought great controversy, Bible readings for the home and Daniel Revelation, never read them. His mother was born in Mackay, Australia. Oh, maybe he was an Australian, uh, but moved to New Zealand. Moved, moved to New Zealand later. Yeah, and then... Fascinating. And then... Uh, Des, Des Ford was born in Townsville, which is just down the road from Mackay. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's weird how many Australians in this real region here. <laughs> Queensland. Um, uh, <laughs> His Catholic, he had a Catholic father who died when he was seven, and so he had a very, very tough life, very poor, and he calls it a sad, tough life. And her, and when leading up to World War II, his mom was so depressed that his that her children would be, would be conscripted into the war that she takes them to this sort of bridge or this sort of cliff with these. And at this point, Desmond Ford is about. 16 years old. Like, that's uh, <laughs> Fred Wright. Fred Wright. He's about 16 years old. And she's going to push her children to, to, to kill them. Uh, wow. Rather than have them go to the war. This is what he says uh, happened. Wow. Um, because she's so low and they're very poor. And, and, and so she's well, at that place. She has nothing to live for. At that moment, she has this... Uh, she was uh, struck by um, a memory of the books in her house, these books. Great controversy, Bible reads for the home, and she said, I think she had a prayer, like, what's there to live for? What, you know, uh, I want and then she's reminded of these books, and she says, I need, I need to read these books before I do anything crazy. So she decides to, yeah, I'm going to be near this thing. 
So she decides to go back and read the books. Remember, she's never met an Adventist. She just happens to have these books in her home that were inherited by her parents that died before before she was even born. She accepts the Sabbath. She reads the books and she accepts the Sabbath, the mom, not realizing that anybody, that there was even a Sabbath-keeping church. This is what Craig mentioned, this sort of legend of Fred Wright. Sort of, uh, because later on, a coal porter comes to their house, knocks on the door, and then, and then the mom says, you should keep the Sabbath. And he's like, whoa, yeah, I, I do. Huh? <laughs> and uh, so he said that you know, sort of the dream... The, the sort of dream person for a coal porter to meet. A person who's already keeping the Sabbath on their own. That doesn't even realize there's a church. Unchurched. So he's astonished. This guy, Arthur Jacobson. I think no relation to Craig Jacobson, I don't think. Mm, no, I have to ask Craig though one yeah, day. Yeah, ask him. Uh, Arthur Jacobson came and Fred Wright mentions him in his book, The Name. And he said about himself, this is Fred Wright speaking, I am told that I was a wild young lad Possessed of boundless energies, tough and shoeless, until I was 18. <laughs> I used to roam the rugged mountain ranges, bringing home the cattle, riding the horses barebacked, and generally being the worry of my poor mother's life. That's this rugged Australian mm. <laughs> background. My, my mother tells a story when she lived in Victoria and she didn't have much shoes and to keep her feet warm when she used to jump into the cow pads when they would because they were warm. Oh, my grandfather did the same. Yeah, to keep the feet warm. No shoes. No shoes. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> tougher times. Yeah. I wouldn't say warm for long. <laughs> he mentions two huge influences in his life. His praying mom, his mom is very serious, Christian, and a blind German farmer that he worked with. Uh, who Fred would always read the Sabbath schools to because he couldn't read it for himself. So he would read the Sabbath schools to this blind farmer. And in 1943, he was baptized at age 18. So that event would have been about 1939 when his mom thought to yes, kill her children. Beginning of the war. So about 32, well, he's 12 or 13. 37. Probably. Married in 1949 to daughters of missionaries and had four children. Interestingly, I think that a reason why a lot of Australians are so, the church was really strong was that there were so many missionaries going off to these islands. Mm -hmm. And um, so they had so much missionary, was part of the church uh, earlier on. And, and I think very successful missionaries, yep. generally, to very. Fiji and Samoa and all New these, Guinea. New Guinea and all these the islands. Yeah. So this is the book I was reading, Brief History of the Early Years of the Sabbath Rest Advent Church. That's their, their church. I think it still exists now. Fred Wright died in the early 90s. What, so the Sabbath Rest Advent Church, so we're about to learn about what that, that is. It's it's called, yeah. Um, they're just not familiar? Uh, yeah. It's independent. It's not, it's, uh, Utah knows a lot about them because they're big in Germany. Okay. Fred Wright started this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Tony and Anna Pace were part of this movement for 20 years. Yeah. And some of our believers in Adelaide uh, were part of this movement. Yeah. Um, they're strongly against Father Son. Yes. So there was a big upheaval in, in the 50s in Adventism. Um, Wheelan and Short rediscover Wagner and Jones and share the general conference. Uh, Fred Wright mentions this in his book. He really honors Wheelan. He says, at Avondale, where Adrian went to school to study theology, there was strong interest in Wagner and Jones. And he mentioned that their books were not on the library shelves, they were in storage. And actually what happened was, that the library, they wanted to throw away a lot of books in storage. So they said that can you they ask the students to sort through these books and whatever they want just to keep or just to, and the ones they don't want, we're going to send away or throw away. And so the Wagner and Jones books were found in storage. And then people were like, what are these books? And they, they mentioned that they took the books. I think, actually, I think they were not allowed to keep them. So they had to took it and they typed them out mm. like, on the typewriters. 
Wow. They actually copied the whole books. Wow. And that's how they started to share the books originally. They were not print, they were not in print, they were not they were shared, and the church denounces this. It says, don't don't share this. And we would say that probably there was some, you know, uh they're college students, so they would have had some probably rebellious uh like, what the heck? You know, you're not sharing the you're not sharing the right books. We knew our teachers are <laughs> right, so, and particularly, right, I'll get to that. And so, according to um, to Fred Reich, he, he he gets he gets into this in the early fifties, the mid fifties, and uh, he and you know, the character of God is much later. So he says a lot of this starts with victory over sin. Um, he, the big things that are important for Fred Reich are victory over sin and the nature of Christ. That, that really caused a, a break. Mm. That's where it starts. So he was a woodshop teacher uh, at the school. He became an elder in 1953 with a good reputation. That would have been Longburn in New Zealand, where he's a woodshop teacher, I think. Yes. And was there at some point? So yeah. yeah. He was not himself at Avondale. He was mentioning that this movement yes. was starting at Avondale. Yeah. But it had it, it reaches him. Hmm. He has this administration of death. He doesn't use that term, but he does dealing with the rebellious students. Interesting. And he mentions this. I want to read this. I think it's really profound. He, he writes really well. He says, "I found my patience tried beyond its limits, so that my fury was generated against them, against the students. He just cannot handle these students that refuse to to listen, you know, uh, to him. There were times when I could cheerfully have banged their heads against the wall." <laughs> but there was a constraining influence which kept me from doing that. I had a good reputation to preserve. I did not want the censure of the principal or the board, so I suppressed my rage and kept it under so that it hardly showed on the outside. And I think, especially some of the older generation in Adventism, I think, had some sense of this sort of rage among the older generation, against, especially against the rebelliousness that was entering into the world in the 50s and 60s and 70s, yeah. post war. If you take a steam boiler and light a vigorous fire beneath it, with the outlets all sealed off, it is true that it will hold for a time, but the pressure will mount and mount. Should the fire be put out for a time, the pressure will drop without there being the outburst of an explosion. But as the fire is again heated and maintained, the time will come when the boiler will blow. The longer it holds against the mounting pressure, the greater the explosion in the end. So it was with me. As the pressure of temptation upon me during the week heated my anger day by day, I shut off all the outlets so that the wrath within could not escape. This is sort of really old covenant trying to control his anger using willpower. <clears throat> but it was there nonetheless, so that the time had to come when it would explode. The longer I held out the worse the worst was the outburst, but it finally came. Usually, it came during the weekend when I was home. Then my undeserving wife wow. and children were the recipients of the wrath that others had generated. So he couldn't lay it on the students, so he laid it out on his wife and his children. When all the harsh words had been spoken and all the pent-up pressure spent, I would then feel guilty and remorseful. I would go to the Lord and beg his forgiveness and promise ever so earnestly that I would never do it again. With firm, courageous determination, I would return to the classroom to find the whole procedure repeated. Again. again, the attitude of the boys would stir my wrath. Again, I would close off all the outlets. Again, there would be a build, a build up and explosion. Again, there would be repentance and a plea for forgiveness. Then again, there would be another failure. The cycle of the old covenant. I was trying and failing, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting over and over again. It was a Roman 7 experience without a doubt. This is really important for Fred Wright, the Romans 7, Romans 8. There was a huge controversy mm. over Romans 7, whether Romans 7, who's that picturing? Who, um, and he says it's a man in the Old Covenant. Right? It's not a man in the New Covenant, or it shouldn't be. It's the old man. Though we can fall into that sometimes. I could not understand myself and the book of Romans. And the book of Romans seemed the hardest book in the Bible to understand. I searched for the answers, I listened to other preachers to see what they could say about the matter, but everywhere it was apparent that even the most leading men in the church were experiencing the same frustration 
as I myself was. So I settled down to a protective philosophy which rationalized my experience into an experience of the saved. I reasoned that I was earnest and sincere, that I was doing the very best I could, and that in the great, day of, great judgment day, the Savior would say, this man did his best, even though he did live a sinful life upon the earth. So we will forgive him, and we and will give him a place in the kingdom. And that's how you're saved living in sin. And basically he's saying that as the gospel was taught in the church at that time, it, it didn't give him victory. It didn't give him victory. And we know now that if you don't believe in victory, then he'll never give victory. If you don't, if you don't believe the victory is necessary, then of course he won't preach uh, a victory over sin message. What happens is a young man comes from, 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 uh, from Avondale who has been studying Wagner and Jones and says, no, like, Wagner and Jones are preaching victory over sin and blah, 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 and hitting all these verses. And, and, uh, and Fred Wright's struck. First he, first, he doesn't understand what's being said, but then he thinks about it and he's struck with this fearful sense that he's not saved. He's not saved. And... And he says this, Up until that point, I had believed that I could not live without sin. Suddenly, the fearful implications of this belief came home to my mind with striking force. I saw that if I believed that I would sin every day, then this was to believe that Satan was stronger than Christ and that sin was stronger than righteousness. And so he starts to study this. He starts to look at Wagner and Jones. And he starts to get relief. He starts to get victory. And he shares about this uh, victory and... Uh, I don't want to go through all of it, but through, um, when we were here at, at Tabernacles, Daniel Chang kind of expressed that, that sense of just studying it. You start to get victory without even realizing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what happened. As he started to look at this more and more and realize what they were saying, he starts to feel himself getting less angry at his students or dealing with his anger better. And then uh, he's really um, encouraged when his, something happens with his wife. And then his wife keeps expecting him to blow up, and he doesn't blow up. And at the end of the day, she's like, what's going on? Like, why aren't, like, you should have blown up, but you didn't. So he's like, oh, I didn't realize. So he's, so he's, that sort of gives him this um, encouragement. This is the right, this is the way I have to go. And that this is important. And I'm not going back. And, if, and, uh, and uh, as I read Fred Wright, he has that sort of, <laughs> he's going to keep going. Like He's uh, very hard-headed hard in a way, or, or very, um, he's willing to go against the grain. And, but it's, it's good to have that uh, testimony in yourself that, that you are getting victory. So when everybody's bashing you, you feel, um, you feel like you're not crazy. And this is what we get into this. So he talks about questions on doctrine, and he says that no sooner had they rejected Whelan and, and Short that the evangelical Protestants come in and start to question mm. the church. So, 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 I hadn't made that connection. Yeah, he makes this connection. He says they rejected it, and boom, right away they come in and start mm. to question uh, Walter Barthouse. Um, interestingly, Walter Martin is only 28. So here they are letting a 28 year old judge the church. Whoa. Barnhouse was 50, 58, and Barnhouse was the Martin was Barnhouse was a mentor of Martin. These were Presbyterians, and um, and Barnhouse had a magazine, in, and in nineteen fifty they research and they come to an agreement. Basically, the big thing is they they through kind of double speak they get Barnhouse to understand that there is no continual ministration of Jesus. I'll look into that, how they word that. But that's that was Barnhouse's big thing, a, a few different things, but the big one was the sanctuary, Jesus in the sanctuary, like, no, no, no. The work is done at the cross. That was that was the evangelical position. And if you think that it's not done, then that's heresy. You're a cult. You're a cult. And they didn't want to be a cult. The Barnhouse had a lot of say. In 1956, in Eternity Magazine, he published an article, Are the Seventh-day Adventists Christians? And he said, yes, they are. 
But in the past, he said they were not. I, he said in the past, I've said that they're not Christians. But now I've realized that they are Christians on their main doctrines. They have a few weird side doctrines, but the main things are good enough to be Christians. And this seems funny that we could allow ourselves to be judged like this. But this was a big deal. And later on, he uh, Barnhouse dies in 1960. Doesn't, doesn't live much longer. But his wife mentions later in her biography of Barnhouse. She says that this article was a blockbuster. It was like the most famous article ever printed in their magazine. And, uh, and that she wrote that the reaction was immediate. Many people outraged canceling of subscriptions. So many people were so outraged that he said they're Christians, they canceled their subscription. This is how, that's the fire of the Presbyterians and the Evangelicals. No, Adventists are not Christians. We're not so there's some of those, and then there was also grateful commendation because Barnhouse had the courage to admit he had been wrong in the past about the Adventists. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was two sides. Um, so this was a big deal. Big deal and not a big deal at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the funny thing. Like, I was thinking about the Mormons. You know, the Mormons were considered a cult until, but now, like, the Mormons, basically, they don't care. And in a way, they get sort of respect for that. Like, yes, like, I went to the Mormon temple, and they just put it in your face. Like, we believe that you'll be married in heaven. You'll be with your family. You believe, we believe straight up that you can be baptized for people who are dead. Just, like, blatantly. And I kind of respected that. Like, wow, you just really yeah. put it out there. Like, <laughs> you know, take it or leave it. Like, and uh, we don't need you to tell us. We don't care if you tell us if you think we're a cult. And in some, in a sense, a sense that like, I admired that, whereas the Adventists were sort of like, do we want to fit in? Do we? It's sort of, it's sort of a little bit sad, but uh, that we needed this, these guys' approval. This is what he wrote. This is one thing I, I got this picture from uh, Seventh Day Press, Andy Whitehurst. So, thanks. Further, they do not believe. And this is a little bit funny, but I'll just look at this. They do not believe, as some of their earlier teachers taught, that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary, but instead that he was still carrying on a second ministerial work since 1844. Wow. So they used to believe check, yeah. that, they, that Jesus was carrying on ministerial work. Now they don't believe that anymore. That's what Barnhouse understood he wrote in this article. So, just showing that there's sort of... And then I saw, in Questions on Doctrine, it says this, which is interesting, because it's trying to have it both ways. When therefore one hears an Adventist say, or reads an Adventist literature, even in the writings of Ellen White, that Christ is making atonement now, it should be understood that we mean simply that Christ is now making application of the benefits of the wow. sacrificial atonement he made on the cross. Wow. So it's, it's trying to have it both ways, and... It's moving very much toward penal substitution. Because the benefits of a sacrificial atonement, it's a strange. Um, it has to do with Christ's work and, and how he's able to, to reconcile God. So that's sort of move that direction rather than. I mean, it's sort of lawyerly speak. You could kind of interpret it different mm -hmm. ways. But uh, yeah, so. Um, I think, I think a lot of this has been sort of mysterious for us, like, what does this mean? But I think as we've started to study more about the atonement, I think all this has started to become more clear to us. What Jesus is doing, how he's ministering. Because when I look at the 50s and a lot of the arguing between the different sides, there's a lot of arguing over um, technicalities, but I think not, not a true, clear, positive theological understanding mm. of what is actually happening on both sides of the conservatives and the liberals. Yeah. And this is a famous Ellen White quote. All need to be more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement. All. <laughs> so all of us need to be more intelligent. Which is going on in the sanctuary above. When this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God and their efforts will be successful. So, uh, sometimes I see that 
the very areas where there is controversy is an area that we need to study more on. That we shouldn't just assume that we understand it. Anyway, Fred White continues in his book. He says, I was soon became, I soon became known as one who believed in living righteously. And while the, other, while the church leaders declared that perfection was impossible. And we know that all these words have many connotations because everybody has a different idea of what, what is perfection. Um, and because of our human nature, we tend to look, think of perfection in terms of the channel and Having always having good posture, mm -hmm. and never saying um when you speak, or having perfect hair, this sort of thing, uh, and so that that was external, sort of external. And I was talking to Wayne about this, and I think that once we have <coughs> the right understanding of doctrine, that will flow into our externals. But we want to. Of course we want to work on our externals too, those are some sort of symbol. But if something is usually if something is happening in our life, like like Fred White says, something's happening, we're getting angry in this to, it means that something's wrong in our doctrine. Turn off the tab, stop mopping up the floor. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to just keep bailing out the boat, you want to stop where the water is flooding into the boat. Uh, yeah. I'm talking these two guys, Robert and John Brinsby. Mm-hmm. They were the two really they, they called it the Brimsmead controversy. They were the very they were very young and very active in trying to preach Wagner and Jones in Australia. Feelings became intense and the church disfellowshipped many people, including Fred Wright. Uh, and the church became divided over the issues. The big issue, one of the big issues was the nature of Christ. What so what did they ultimately disfellowship him for believing in, in victory over sin? Yeah. Okay. And I think also it had to do with, they basically said, stop sharing this. Wow. And they're not stopping. So. Okay, so conduct then as well. Like, yeah. like a... Conduct connected to doctrine. Mm -hmm. And Brimsmead, as I understand it, was very, <clears throat> he had a very fiery way of going against the church. Mm -hmm. You can see it's quite different than Wieland. Um, and I think, but this, yeah, so... It's called, called this a brings me awakening. Interesting that this is how Fred White interprets this. I, I don't know if this is this is true. He says there was a parting of ways with Ab in the Adventist Church. For the second and last time, God brought the third angel's message in verity to the church, but sad to say, they determinedly rejected it. So you wanted to say that this is like a re-preaching of the third angel's message, and it was rejected, and thus. In his mind, and I'll talk about this, the church no longer becomes the church of God. That's how he convinces himself that separation is okay. Um, yeah. So he thought it was kind of like the second chance, and then no more chances after that. Yeah, but then it's like, how do you know that? Um, or how, who decides? Who decides? This is a, this is a big problem because in his book, Fred Wright talks a lot about separation. And it's an issue that he feels strongly about. And I'll show you that there's some problems, I think, with what his doctrine of separation. Hey, but let's look at Robert Grimsby first. This is a very, very strange character. He's still alive. In the 60s, he was the big band promoting per perfectionism. In the 70s, he switches. He gives it up, and he switches to justification by faith. He gives up victory. He gives up victory over sin. And he says that, oh no, we'll be sinful until Jesus comes. He switches, and then he switches again. In the 80s, he rejects the Sabbath. He leaves. He just rejects the Sabbath. He becomes a liberal Christian. Doesn't even believe in the divinity of Christ anymore. Whoa. In the 90s, he goes into politics, <laughs> and he's not even really. Christian anymore. He enters into local politics. I think he's the mayor of his town and in a local, and he starts this tropical fruit world, big theme park. That was about half an hour from where I used to live, down on the Gold Coast. Yeah, so, tropical yeah. fruit world. Yeah. So he's a, he's, a, he's a rich man, I guess. Um, big businessman. Uh, and then according to the Standish Brothers, in the 1980s, it is difficult to believe the emotional reaction which the name Brinsmead conjured up in the minds of the majority of Adventists in Australia two decades earlier. 
To have a name Brimsby associated with a church member was akin to being termed pink in the McCarthy era in the United States. So I don't know if you know the McCarthy, like in the 50s, if you were, McCarthy said, you're pink, you're a communist, your life is ruined. You could no longer work in politics. You could, like if you were an actor, you, were, you couldn't work in Hollywood anymore. So basically that was what happened. If you had the name Brimsmead, that's it. You were like, you were like uh, uh, taboo. You were, no one was supposed to talk to you. That's how strongly people didn't like Brimsmead. Interestingly, Brimsmead had a website and recently he started writing articles about the gospel again. It's just, uh, so he's still around. It's strange that somebody's that long ago, yeah. We got him there sort of not really good articles. Yeah, just, but yeah, so he's uh, lived a good long life. And he's the one that uh, commissioned and published this book by Edward Fudge, The Fire That Consumes. Very influential book about annihilationism that's saying that hell is not eternal. He funded his research and asked him to study the subject. Yeah, so he had, he had money to fund this. Hmm. And this book is very, was very influential in evangelical circles. So that, because um, in 1980, he becomes so influenced by Desmond Ford, that he's like, is anything we believe true? Any Adventist thing true? I don't even know anymore. Uh, and so he commissions Fudge to see if annihilation is even true. And, uh, Fudge was in the States though, right? Fudge is in the States, he's a Southern Baptist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Alabama. Oh, man. And I was made into a movie, or I think. Yes. That was uh, by Pat Arbido. Yeah. Hal and Mr. Fudge. And interestingly, I found this article in Christianity Today. I couldn't read the whole thing because it's members only, but they said that. The, so the name of the article is the, the recent, to add this word recent, the recent truth about Seventh day Adventism. This was published in 1990. <laughs> and it says, 10 years after Seventh-day Adventists defrocked one of their leading evangelicals, they are still debating their true identity. So it's clear. It's clear to the world that Adventists aren't sure of their own identity. They're not, they're not, they're not sure of their own, where they want to go theologically. Who are they referring to, referring to here, 10 years after they defrocked one of their leading evangelicals? Who is that? Desmond Ford. So that just shows how famous Desmond Ford is. He's getting a this defense of him in Christianity today. In, in Australia, there was an Anglican minister called Geoffrey Paxton, and he wrote a book called The Shaking of Adventism, and he was able to get into a lot of liberal Adventist churches and preach, and basically supporting Desmond Ford. And it, was, it, was, it was huge. Wow. So... Um, Church officials claimed Ford's teaching undermined their fundamental doctrines, while other observers believed he was merely trying to bring Adventist teaching into line with the Bible and the Reformation. Are Adventist evangelicals? Walter Martin thought they were close. Walter Martin writing 1956, 1960, when he took Adventists out of his book that they're not a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they were still considered cults. Adventists were taken out. But after the Ford Affair, critics suggested they were moving in the wrong direction. So, it's like Walter Martin said that, they're, that they're, they're not a cult, but it seems like they're moving back into being a cult by getting rid of Desmond Ford. This is amazing how they can just put pressure on, on you like this. Is that Desmond Ford on the... Yes, that's Desmond Ford. William Miller. Yeah. 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 You know, when a conservative Adventist gets defrocked, <laughs> they, don't, they don't write art, you know. I mean, to be fair, like, Desmond Ford was semi-famous. But it's a whole, I just think, it's a whole system. Because to be famous, you need to write scholarly articles that are accepted by them. And that's how you make a name for yourself. If you write Adventist theology, you won't be published in their journals. And thus, your name won't become famous in the outer world. And so, thus, when conservatives are defrocked, they don't, they don't care. They don't know about it. But when a, a liberal is defrocked, oh. So. There's a split with Brimsmead. 
So what happens is, Brimsby uh, uh, actually asks Fred Wright to work with him. Fred Wright doesn't want to. Later, he feels called to preach. First, he feels not called to preach. Then he feels that there's a calling. He hears a sort of voice to preach. And then he's, but he ends up splitting with Brimsmead because Brimsmead <coughs> believed these interesting theories that the judgment of the living takes place before the latter rain can fall. It's kind of weird. So we would believe that. I think we would agree with Fred Wright that the latter rain falls first, then the judgment. What is the latter rain? Yeah. <laughs> latter rain and the judgment are kind of. Well as, well, as Joan says, it's a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness. And if you reject it, then you are judged. So it's confusing. It's sort of a fight that's not really. It's another one of these like fights that it's not really hitting the issue. But this is a big one. He rejects victory over sin. And Romans 7 is, describes the experience of a converted man and more and more advocated. <coughs> so then Brimsby said, we have to go back to Adventist church. But at this point, Fred Wright says, no, we cannot go back. And this is an interesting. He has a separate session. I think this is bizarre. And uh, I cannot really agree with this. I wonder what Adrian thinks. He says, so people keep asking, like, what, you know, the church is not Babylon. He gets all these quotes. And, you know, and Fred Wright explains it this way. I, I presented a life and they received on both the deliverance and the separation messages. So the deliverance is victory over sin. So they call it the sort of messages they receive from God. They have the same message for separation from sin in the individual is succeeded by separation from sinners in the church. It's weird. It's weird. It kind of makes sense, but it's also like, mm, I don't know about that. Because all of a sudden, Separating from sin yourself, and then separating from sinners, you, you, separating from sinners requires judging them, it's a, separating it's from It's a them. denial of the cross. Mm. Yeah. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. And yes. It's Pharisees. Exactly. So, and it, and it, leads into, it leads into strange things happening in their movement. We began, as we always do, by preaching the everlasting gospel, which has the capacity to separate the sinner from the sins. Amen. Okay. This is naturally followed by the separation of the sinner from the body of those who, having rejected present truth, have become Babylon, out of whom God's people are called in order to escape the destructive plagues which shall utterly destroy them. The problem with this is that, okay, you move from the church, but let's say we're all gathered together, and I feel like you're not accepting things according to my standard, do I separate or do I kick you out? This is no divine pattern. Yeah. No blessing of channel blessing. Yeah, so this is a big issue. It becomes an issue later. And he uses this text to say that uh, those who deny Christ came in the flesh, he used every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And when he's antichrist, so the church no longer believes that Christ came in the flesh, they're antichrist. Hmm. The problem with this text is that yes, you can interpret it that way, but there's multiple ways this text can be interpreted. It can also mean that Christ was born as a human. Right? Like denying that would be the most hmm. basic way of understanding the text. That he wasn't a phantom. Yeah, he wasn't a ghost, or hmm. he wasn't um, yeah, exactly. he had a human body. He had a human body. Hmm. His incarnation was real. He was really born of, of Mary. This secondary meaning of Christ entering into our flesh. That's another. Uh, so there's multiple meanings of this text. So, but he uses this to say, bam, like, SDA church right off the bat. And we're continuing on. So this is the result of the separation message. A lot of, there's a, become, there starts to be a lot of pressure to not have sin in the camp. And also a lot of pressure about what to do with sin. It can create a difficult environment. And this is being driven by the investigative judgment doctrine. We don't want plagues coming on us. Mm. Like, oh, uh, you know, Ben, you're not a vegetarian? Uh, mm. You're not in present truth. The plagues are going to come upon you. You're bringing... Mm. This is very... It's, it's a little bit and toxic. And we need, we need to separate from you. Yeah. 
there becomes a lot of pressure to organize. And a lot of his booklets talking about organization. <coughs> it's, to me, it's, it comes across confusing. And not good. A lot of emphasis on performance. And this is an interesting one. What about marriage? What if you're married to someone who is sinning? Or you're married, though, you're one flesh. Big pro- it becomes a big problem. Um, I believe personally that God accommodated because, because of these events of QOD, questions of the doctrine, and because of rediscovering Wagner and Jones, many were kicked out. Many, and they needed a shepherd. And so God allowed Fred Wright to be that shepherd others. But it, it's still not ideal. So something similar is sort of happening in the father-son movement, where, uh, there, I mean, yes, there was, there was separation and um, the church kicking people out. What, what I mean is that, uh, how, do I put this? how do I put this another way? God knows that because of people, people's nature, they sometimes are thrown into situations that they don't even know how they got there. And they, need, they still need shepherding, they still need help even if the place they're at is not necessarily good. So, like, for example, Tim Jennings. He, he's sort of a preacher for people who need character of God, but for whatever reason, they can't break out of father-son. But it has consequences. They're not, it's not full, full, uh, it's not full uh, light of the message. So, what, what I'm trying to say is that for people inside, there's Wheeland, to sort of bring the character of God to. For people outside, there's Fred Wright. Kind of something like that. So God blesses Fred Wright. Even though some things are wrong, he still blesses Fred Wright with this beautiful character of God message, which is kind of a miracle that he was able to make his way there. Um, I mentioned later that I was reading online somebody saying that, and maybe I mentioned this, but yeah, that marriage, that some people try to teach that divorce is okay because of because of separation message. That if your wife mm. or husband is not is a sinner, you need to divorce them, separate. That's a logical consequence. Very unhealthy. Um, Fred White has some beautiful insights that are very similar to us. And he talks about, and Adrian's many times preached about this. That he says that because the church is lacking the true gospel, they have to use emotion and have to use to raise use music to sort of get people fired up. And so the point. Well, can you reiterate the point on the last slide? Um, who who is sharing what there on, regarding the marriage thing? I I I found somebody who was in the Fed Right movement who had left and was talking about all what she had seen what she experienced. I don't know if it's true, but one of the things that they said was that we were taught that it's okay to divorce. Oh. Because of, or that, and, and, well, I'm not sure if that's true, but it would be something that could be inferred from the from the, the separation message. So in his book, Child Salvation, which you picked up this morning, the last night or whatever, um, we were reading, he has a chapter called Marriages Forever, mm-hmm. where he like extensively covers like Christ never divorces yeah. his people mm-hmm. and he's saying that it's, we should follow that example like if someone chooses to leave by free will we can give them that free will but never divorce them if they're willing to stay around you know examples being um, the children of Israel um, yeah. uh, Cain all these different you know individuals throughout the scripture so I just wanted to make because that's what I thought you understood yeah, that's what I think a force Fred Wright would not say that divorce directly divorce is okay. I don't think. Um, but what I'm saying is that Well, Fred Wright ended up separating from his wife and being connected to someone else. Yes, yeah, so Fred Wright himself. Yeah, so hmm. oh. and and when the doctrine like this sort of thing, I mean you can say all you want that God is love, but when God's burning people forever, it, it still has this inference that moves you in a certain direction. And if you have a certain belief of separation, people can infer from that. Even if the leader doesn't necessarily agree, people can teach that, mm. oh, your husband is gambling and drinking? Like, that's sick, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, or, or, it's uh, maybe not divorce, but it, it's 
a pressure on the marriage. Mm -hmm. Performance pressure. I don't know, but I, I'm not sure. That, that's just what somebody wrote online. And, um, that, those thoughts were definitely expressed in the conservative Adventist movement in Australia mm. in, the, in, the, in the late 70s and early 80s. You know, I heard those thoughts expressed. Like? About separating from a spouse, it just wasn't. And I heard of cases where that happened, like, well, you're not living up to the light, so. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Not just Fred Wright. Yeah. yeah. Um. It kind of fits our performance way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it says, Jesus needs no emotional stimulus in order to get people stirred up into a state of excitement. And then, uh, so he's just saying that. And Fred White was known, people said that he's not really the greatest preacher, but he was a great teacher. And he, he was able to take people step by step into something. Um, and uh, yeah, that's why I mentioned it. Constantly moving forward. Uh, he gave a sense of movement in the message, progression, learning more. I think this is actually one of the great things of Adrian and our message is this sort of, we build this, we build this, and there's a sense of like moving forward. It's not just random doctrines just here and there. And I think he was able to give that feel, and that's what allowed him to make a, a movement. He portrayed God as a doctor trying to heal sin. His emphasis on this led to character of God. And this is a famous slide. Sin is not what you do, but what you are. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> it's just another one of those. It's one of those things that, like, to make a point, you hit it, hit at it oppositionally. It's a, um, it's a performance framework. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. So, um, but the idea being that. Sin is a part of our flesh and it needs to be healed. The Church of Theocracy, I, 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 would, I would compare this, I would really suggest we read this booklet that Adrian really addresses this because I think that he has sort of a similar understanding of Wagner and Jones on the <coughs> organization. And because of the, because of the Trinity, I, I believe it leads to difficulties in how to organize the church. And uh, I, I, I'll skip this one. Let me, let me just do this. This is interesting. This is something that Fred would do. It is when man sinned or broke the law, he lost his spiritual life. Therefore, the broken law is a life taker. Okay? When man sinned or broke the law, he lost his spiritual life. The broken law is a life taker. If the broken law is a life taker, then the unbroken law must be a life giver. <laughs> He would, this is what Fred would do, he would, he would wait for us to answer, inevitably most of us would fall into the trap and say, life giver. Mm. So we, we, we did it. We did it. <laughs> yeah. it's not At which point giver. Fred would correct us with Galatians 3.21, if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Mm. It's not life giver. The broken law is a life taker, and the unbroken law is a life Preserver. preserver. Mm. Christ is a life giver. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then, <laughs> I'm thinking life giver. I'm like, what? <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> and he said that Fred, Fred by used to love doing this, and he would, he would catch people. See, you guys are caught in this legalistic framework. You're still thinking that law, the law gives life. And he said that the one person who, who, who caught it was Fred Reilly, uh, Robert Reilly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's also what he does not maybe hit out is what Adrian's done when he's does something similar. It's the oppositional thinking we yes. have. It's just natural for us to think yeah. oppositional. Yeah, just thinking that. Yeah. yeah. It seems right to us. Just, yeah. well, that, yeah. That's true. The opposite must be... Yeah. Broken, unbroken, yeah. taker, giver. I mean, it's yeah. it's logical. It's kind of set up. Yeah. Christ gives life. He is the life giver. He gives <laughs> his life. He, he gives us his life and we preserve it by obeying the law. And he, and he said that um, Wheeler was one of the few people that right away got this. He's my guy. Yeah, he's cool. So this is just an interesting thing that they mentioned. And uh, lastly, there was a, just a short article. I couldn't find that much about the character of God. Sadly, like he talks, he never, he doesn't reach his his book about his early life. He dies before he finishes it, and he doesn't 
explained clearly how he got the character of God. Interestingly, what he says is that he had these thoughts early on, but he thought them not important originally, which is interesting. Um, but later on, he, he says, um, he puts them, he starts to think about God being a healer, if that's the case, that it, he shouldn't destroy, it doesn't make sense. He, he writes it into an article. And then he doesn't think of that much of it. He just writes it in an article and he releases it. Does God destroy it? He says, even then, I didn't think it was a, bit, it was a very large or very consequential subject to even wow. be preached about. Didn't realize. Wow. It's so funny. So he's preaching all these other subjects, separation, none about theocracy, and but the most important thing, the thing that Fred White has most remembered by, all his other books are basically forgotten, except for the character of God. I mean, pretty much, right? Mm. And he's written many books, I think a lot of them have good material, but what he's remembered for is the character. He didn't even realize that it was a large subject. You just, you just mentioned the word theocracy. What, what do they have to say about that? He says that, there's some truth to it, he says that we don't make decisions by vote, voting is not theocracy. Mm. Um, so they would say something like, it's just a little bit, I think, naive or idealistic. So you say like, they, wanted, they needed a new publishing group, person to publish. And they won't just name a person to do it. They won't take a vote. They said that God needs to tell someone to do it. God will tell. Him. And so someone comes to him and is like, I want to do it. And, and then and, and Fred White's like, well, I don't know if you should do it. Did God tell you to do it? And the guy's like, yeah. <laughs> and then he comes and he's crazy. It doesn't work out. It's just like weird stuff like that where like, it's like, it's a bit... I, I see what he's saying, but it's not really practical. Uh, yeah. In talking to Tony and Anna about this, because they didn't have the divine pattern, the issue of organization became a real problem. Mm -hmm. And they ultimately moved towards a theocracy where he essentially was saying, look, I'm Moses and you will do what I tell you to yeah. do. Mm -hmm. And that, that really started to create stress for the movement. Yeah. Uh, but then his adultery and remarriage or it, that that diminished him and then yeah, the new leaders came in and changed every a, lo a lot of the organizational structure. Mm. Tony and Anna can give you more details on that. But mm. They're very strange. Um, but they describe leaders from the church coming into their home, looking through their cupboards to see what food they had in the cupboards. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so incompatible with the character of God. It, it, it yeah. is. It, it, yes. It was one thing Anna shared with me because I told her we were reading Cal Salvation. And yeah, she said, like, there's definitely some good principles in there, but ultimately, because he's coming from a Trinitarian framework, and like Adrian was talking about the equality based on performance and age and wisdom and all that, like, it, it has to end up being legalistic. There's no other yeah. kind of conclusion to come to, even if the principles, some of the principles are sound, it, it doesn't have the divine pattern, so. And we saw that as we continued reading, for sure. That was mm. an issue. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, so this is what happens. He goes to this German camp meeting. He says, I was not going to preach on this subject. But before I got there, there was a European man comes to him uh, and says, <coughs> it was, and he's deeply disturbed by this article. And says that I was this deep, deep air. So he doesn't even, hasn't even preached on it. Somebody's already like, comes to him and says, once I have an interview, and for three hours, he reads to me a long list of Ellen White statements. So, is this familiar to us? <laughs> three hours. A list of statements that told me flatly and plainly that my concept in regard to this was totally wrong, and if I was going to present this at the camp meeting, that he was going to go home straight away. And he's not going to listen. That's how strongly he felt. And Brad White is like, what? Whoa. I think he wasn't even going to preach on this, but now that you're so worked up, and I'm oppositional in na nature, yeah. I'm going to preach on this. Yeah, uh, this is important, and this is, yeah, so. <laughs> so, um. And uh, lastly, I, th I think I'll finish here. Uh, he finishes his book with just, it's, it is remarkable how it, it, just certain things do pop up again and again. One of these things is this, the mystery of the cross explains all our mysteries. And he says that, Fred White says that this is what helped me to, he says, I couldn't work it out. How does it all fit? It seems like it's right, but I can't make it work. And he discovers this great controversy quote, the mystery of the cross.
cross explains all of the mysteries and hindrance preaches on this. And the principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. In fact, another, another quote, a great controversy. And, uh, um, and then he just talks about this. My, one, my understanding was wonderfully enlarged, and the problems of the Old Testament disappear. So it's just, it, it is drawn from the same fountain, just trying to put these pieces together. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we end. The book ends without... Oh, that's, that's just a short document on, on, this, on the development of the character of God. But it's only like a few pages. We don't really hmm. know how it happened. Um, yeah, so that's about it. I just want to show you this last thing that Graham Maxwell, I just found this recently, that he wrote a book in 1978, Can God Be Trusted? It was the denominational book of the year. It shows that there are people in the denomination. The, the, the church has not totally rejected a lot of things. Uh, and, um, and he says that he compares the chapter, Why Did Jesus Have to Die, to a similarly titled much earlier article by E.J. Wagner, Why Did Christ Die? So who that, did? McMahon or So somebody Maxwell. who's critiquing this book. McMahon destroyed Wagner. Wow. He wrote a book attacking him. Okay, so he's, he's attacking mm. Graham Maxwell oh, for yeah. writing yeah. similarly. Okay. He's like, how can you, how dare, how, basically how dare Maxwell kind of be inspired by this article, which is a recent article that we're inspired by. <laughs> so we're sort of coming up to the same yeah. ground and hitting a wall. Coming back. Yeah, and... Uh, and of course, moral influence theory, which I listen to Maxwell talk. He's like, oh, moral influence theory is a is an evangelical thing. It's not. It's not even. It's not Adventist. It's not something that. It's totally different than what we're saying. Of course, Maxwell has his own issues, but but I think it's fair to say that what moral influence theory is is, is quite different than what Wagner is saying. And um, it's like calling people Aaron. Yes. Mm. And then Maxwell also says this. <coughs> he talks about it is finished. By the life that he lived and, and the unique and awful way he died, Jesus has demonstrated the righteousness of his Father and has answered any question about God's character mm. and government. Amen. So he's, there's mm. this, there is this thing, that, there is this thing <coughs> in Adventism that wants to, yeah. wants to go forward. God's pushing it from different ways. He's trying to get all the pieces down. together. And uh, um, I believe that Right, in a, in a way, was able to go further than Maxwell because he was separated, mm. had more freedom. Mm. But Maxwell had to be very careful and respectful. And, um, so mm. there is some benefits to being sort of independent. Uh, I know, I know, we know that Adrian would not be able to preach this far if he was still in a church. But you lose influence. That's the, 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 the difficulty. As we all know, we want to share Adrian's sermon. Say, oh, he's been kicked out. Whereas you can share a Maxwell sermon, even though some people hate Maxwell, but at least he, he wasn't kicked out. And, and I think there's a place for these things. Like, there are people out there that <coughs> I think are open, but because of their rigid mindset, they, can't, they just can't listen to people who have been kicked out. They just can't do it. And maybe we can help them by sending a Maxwell sermon. Or something. And, uh, so... Yeah, that's interesting because that was about the same time, 1978, 80, same time as Fred Wright. So all these things kind of, uh, mm. yeah, in the church. And hopefully we can learn from their lessons. And uh, we know that in the end, the Fred Wright movement is, we can talk to Anna and Tony about it, but it's kind of fallen apart a bit. And did, so. did, do you have any more information, Pastor Adrian, about his... Um, Sounds like adultery and, and divorce. Like, was that while he was still leading the movement, or I, I was? To, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure of the details. Okay. Um, I think it happened in Germany. Um, yeah, but I, I don't. I don't know much more about, about that situation. So, I, I distinctly remember his wife, Margaret Wright, had a book on hydrotherapy and and hot and cold treatments, and we used that book and uh, in our home and. Yeah, Fred Wright, a lot of Jones and Wagner books, you, you, you could get them from him. Yeah. Uh, they would print them. Right? They would print them a lot. That's where you got them. Yeah. Uh, um, you can get them in the denomination. So, yes, yeah, so they, were, they were good about promoting that. That's, that's good. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's all. Uh, I mean, there's more work to be done there, and it's not, but that's just uh, I particularly found the separation thing interesting. And mm -hmm. Just to be careful of these things. And hopefully, we can learn from that. Yeah. It's interesting that the first time Willand and Short present the church in 1952 gets rejected, and then you have the Martin and Barnhouse mm -hmm. episode and the massive upheaval that's created then. When, as I presented the other night, you have the 1888 Study Committee presents the church, the Primacy of the Gospel Commission rejects again mm -hmm. in 2001, and then you have 9-11, mm -hmm. which is not only, first time it's, it's, it's a church controversy between churches, but not 9-11 is, <coughs> Interesting. It's, it's, it's worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. It's much bigger than uh, in the 1950s. Mm. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, we just, we want to be led by you. We want to learn from the past. And we don't want to judge these men. I mean, they live in an era with no internet and uh, not no easy communication. And Fred Wright, really amazing. He, he traveled around the world. And, and in his book, I didn't mention it, but he, he really passed through serious trials and difficulties. So uh, we respect that. But we also want to learn from it. And we know that you're the, the reformers and the prophets in the past, even you know John the Baptist being the greatest. You love these men, you led these men, but they didn't have all the truth. And we know that little things can have consequences, especially over time. They build up. So we, Father, help us to uh, purify us, make these things clear to us. We, we want to, to do right by you. We want to learn from, these, from the past that we can finally lay out a whole systematic doctrinal system that could give us true victory over sin mm. and mm. Uh, thus uh, Jesus can come back and suffering in this world could end but we know that there will be more suffering Father so help us I pray in Jesus name Amen Amen <clears throat> 20 minutes